Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Pfeiffer, the host of Conversations on Retail. It is a beautiful day in sunny Northwest Arkansas. We're enjoying the heck out of summer, and I want to welcome all of you that are joining us uh, both live. We've got a handful of folks that are joining us this afternoon live, and I've already asked them to, uh, to submit questions. But I want to welcome Julie Hall, my guest today. Uh, she's, uh, she's an author. She's got a tremendous agency background, worked with big brands, and uh, anxious to hear about the work that she's done uh, and, and her perspective on launching products in this day and age. But this is also an opportunity for us to get to know her as a human. And uh, that's the whole purpose behind Conversations on Retail. So Julie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. You know, when we first started talking about um, me chatting with you, I can't believe it's been 10 years since my book was published. You know, I yeah. spent the better part of gosh, like 15 years really studying new product launches and what makes a launch successful. And the past, you know, five or six years, I've really been focused more on purpose and corporate purpose and how it impacts uh, the bottom line and how to help CEOs really find and uh, leverage their purpose within their organization. So uh, it was such a, it was like, you know, having lunch with an old friend, looking at, yeah. the, at the book, digging the book out. Um, when I look at the cover, um, gosh, so much has changed in 10 yeah. years, right? Yeah. Crazy. It's crazy. Well, and so it's funny. I, I, when I, when I heard from you, I, I wrote an article. I was in, I was so fascinated, uh, by the work of the late Dr. Clayton Christensen from, from yes. Harvard did so much work Love in the area them. of disruptive innovation. And I loved the whole idea of milkshake marketing. And, and I wrote an article, not a book, not anything close to a book, but I wrote an article back in 2014 called harder than it looks. Why so many uh, products fail and and the, the good Dr. Christensen said, I think 75% of all, you know, products will ultimately fail. And his position mm -hmm. was really based on that of utility that they don't meet the they don't meet the needs of consumers. But I, I felt like, you know, not not that I would question a Harvard professor, but I felt like it was it was incomplete, and that there were some other factors. And so I was so excited to, to hear from you and to learn about your book, because I think what what you um, and Joan did was kind of address some of those gaps that uh, that I also saw. So if you would um, talk, in, introduce yourself and give us a little bit of, of, of your background, especially that that's related to your agency experience working with Coca-Cola mm -hmm. and Nestle and Procter mm -hmm. & Gamble and others. Mm -hmm. So uh, Julie Hall, and I am uh, a career marketer. I, as I, if you look at me on LinkedIn, I think I refer to myself as a recovering agency person. Um, I spent the better part of my career uh, agency side working, as you said, with big brands um, from McDonald's. Uh, I had the good fortune of working on their biggest product launch at that time, which was called the Arch Deluxe, if you remember that. Yeah, very, a few, very few well. of my friends from uh, Arnold would, were on here. But yeah, I, I worked on a lot of new product launches. And when I look back on my advertising and public relations years, you know, really, if you're going to an, an agency, you probably, you know, do have a launch that you're looking for, right? And there are so many launches, um, as Professor, Professor Christensen said, um, so many launches fail because they don't, to use his phrase, you know, have a job to be done. That right. was his big thing, you know, the right. job to be done. Um, they don't serve a utility. Um, I always found it so fascinating that, you know, some uh, product launches would happen and fizzle because they didn't really find their, their place, like the Segway, if you remember, the yeah. Segway launch was going to be, it was heralded as the next coming. Um, and I think it, in my Harvard Business Review article, we talk a little bit about Segway and a few other products that launch they peaked before they actually hit critical mass and mm -hmm. found their audience really um but the product launches that i studied um over the course of my career uh, ranged from you know packaged goods to fast food launches to clothing brands um and the most remarkable thing i can say you know 10 years now and in, in looking at the book i was astounded at how relevant it still is I mean, one of the things that we always used to say um, when we when we launched the book, we were doing the publicity tour, is that um, at the time in 20, 2010, 20, 2011, um, this whole idea of the commercialization of chit chat, right? You mm -hmm. saw mommy bloggers were hugely popular and you saw the burgeoning influencer economy, which is now, if you look at the um, business section of, I think it's the New York Times today, there's a huge section on the, what they're now calling the creator economy, right? How to support mm -hmm. the creator economy. This whole idea of the commercialization of chit chat, you know, word of mouth 
and friends and family recommendations, you know, that this goes back to, you know, when Christ roamed the earth. I mean, truly, he was the ultimate influencer as far as messaging, right? So um, it's really nothing new. I think what changes really is the environment. Um, you know, when you look at uh, what's happening right now on TikTok, which is one of the things I'm fascinated with, TikTok as a medium, because they're selling out of products at retail yeah. based on, you know, what these, these, these kids are recommending, right. you know, on TikTok and you're able to search by uh, outfit of the day, you know, OO uh, outfit of the day. Yeah. TD and uh, some of the Hollister and Aeropostale are selling out of products based on these TikTok presence opportunities. So I think that is, you know, an influencer market, much like we've seen, you know, even back when um, new products were launching at retail, you know, making sure that the right people are trying it. One of the things we found time and time again, every year we did the most memorable new product launch survey without fail, sampling was up there as the most effective way to really get awareness around your product. Hmm. What have been some of the most common mistakes that you've seen brands make. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about your work is you you call out rightly that the big brands are not immune from the same challenges um, that are faced by some of the smaller. Because I think a lot of us attribute, you know, if you're going to launch a product, we think about the smaller people and how, how you know, on a, on a, on a shoestring budget, how are you going to get your story out and how are you going to, but even, even big brands like Coke and Procter and Gamble, they, they get it wrong all the time and may, maybe not get it wrong, but the, the, the consumer doesn't respond in, in ways that they believe that they will. Right, right. Oh my gosh, one of my favorite um, favorite launches was, uh, which was a launch disaster, was um, PepsiCo launched a, uh, remember Alestra? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the product was just the belly, so The awful. belly ache, right. The belly ache. I think the, the, they called um, the test market the diarrhea capital of the world. I mean, that's right. a horrible thing to have right. to live down, right? So I think first and foremost, and this isn't, you know, um, any rocket science here, you got to have a good product, right? You, you have to have a good product. Um, a good product is going to trump anything. But it's interesting. One of the things that I, I found um, through working on new product launches, but also studying them is not having solid distribution is a real flaw. Um, and I can remember uh, a product that's actually in the Harvard Business Review article, and I think you can get it online. Um, we launched a product called the Cell Zone. And the Cell Zone was so way ahead of its time in uh, that you needed a private place to have a conversation when you're on a phone, on your cell phone. And they um, had a few available at Harvard Business School, Columbia, um, some you know very high level quiet places, right? And we launched them with a huge blitz and I, I could date it actually because we got coverage on the Today Show. I think they had, uh, the product was on the, the it had launched at the National Restaurant Show because they were trying to reach restaurateurs who wanted to offer their customers a pri private place to have a, a telephone call. Um, and that talking on your cell phone in a restaurant was so rude. And somebody saw it and immediately a producer from the Today Show was like, we w have to have this you know, on the plaza, get it out here right away. You know, And our team did and got it out there. And it was incredible, the flurry of orders they got, but they couldn't deliver. They couldn't, mm. they didn't have the products available. What a waste of money. Right. you know, to have that, that flurry and it, you know, that whole, sometimes, you know, if you build it, they will come yeah. strategy is, you know, a, a great intention, but if you can't deliver and you can't bottle that lightning in a bottle again, you know, you only have one launch yeah. and if you don't hit it right, it's uh, it can really, uh, it can be costly. Yeah. I've thought a lot about kind of the democratization of every aspect of consumer product, uh, innovation, development, sourcing, sales, marketing. And I wonder if it's, and I'd love your perspective, obviously, is, is it getting easier or is it getting more, more difficult? I mean, one can say, well, you know, we, we have, we have reach and the ability to, to, to build audiences and create community like we've never had before. But at the same time, it seems like the technology and this, this, you know, market effect has made it so easy for just about anybody to, to create products and, and sell products is, is the, are the, are the platforms or communication platforms becoming so saturated and even the marketplace is becoming so saturated that it's actually becoming harder than, than it was before. 
you're absolutely right. It's harder and it's easier, you know, and that's a terrible answer, but it's true. I mean, you, it is, especially for beauty brands. I think you're seeing beauty brands. And I was just um, working with a client on research around Instagram sales and beauty brands are breaking through incredibly because they have really learned to understand the swiping strategy and getting people to stop in their tracks when they're going through your feed and you see a product. I can't tell you during this pandemic, how many products I bought on Instagram that, you know, I had no business buying, you know, uh, leg tanner, um, back scratchers, you know, all sorts of things that you see that are visually stimulating. That's just one click. So it makes it so easy to buy. So that's one way that it's easier. I think one way that it's harder is how difficult it is to just insert your story into all of this, right? Mm -hmm. There are more channels, but they're different channels and they're so segmented and it's so hard to break through that any sort of uh, go-to-market strategy that you had before or that you've experienced, and we're probably about the same age, I mean, it's a completely different marketplace and it's yeah. completely digital now too. I mean, the old, old ideas of you know, doing sampling and doing couponing, it's just, it doesn't work anymore because it's, everything's digital. And I think those that are versed in, you know, how to, you know, have a bifurcated strategy where you're reaching those influencers, but you're also knowing digitally what psychologically is going to stop consumers in their tracks, understanding their behavior and the emotion behind why they're shopping is so important. And that's another thing that we saw here during the pandemic is the importance of emotion in, in retail. Yeah. You know, I was at a technology conference here in Bentonville. It's been, it's probably been every bit of five years ago, maybe, maybe longer. And um, there was a moderator on stage, a friend of mine. And there were, then there were people from, from Walmart and from within the supplier community that were taking questions from the audience. And my friend, the moderator was having us text him our questions. And I, I text him a question. I said, at what point do retailers become unnecessary as intermediaries between brand and, and consumer? And uh, he wouldn't ask him the question, but I'm curious about your perspective on that because it, it seems like, you know, again, at Walmart and Amazon, they've got just an enormous customer base. And so being a part of that ecosystem, a part of that marketplace in some ways makes all the sense in the world, but it's becoming easier and easier. And of course it, it costs, but um, it's becoming more expensive to do business with, you know, Walmart and Amazon, the others as well does it make more sense to be spending your time focused, your time and, 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 and resources focused on light, building lifetime value with those customers you can interact with directly as opposed to putting all your eggs in, in the basket of those um, major retailers? The online retailers, for sure. You know, I'm, um, I'm a grocer's daughter. My father owned grocery stores. So I was very well versed in the, the slim margins in grocery. Mm -hmm. Um, and slotting fees, you know, and all of the stuff that went along with that, you know, how difficult it was to make make any money on that. I'm also pained um, when I see, and you know, I worked for a few years when I was at Havas with um, Sears Holdings Company, so Sears and Kmart, um, and it, it really, it pains me to watch the death of, of these giant, you know, American uh, retailers, you know, Lord and Taylor, JC, well, JC Penny, might go public through a SPAC, I think I just read earlier this week, but you see these, these department stores that are completely dying. And you know that the future is that Amazon truck that drives down my street seven or eight times a day, dropping off everyone's things. So I think that, um, you know, retail uh, that what we're seeing happen um, as a result of the pandemic, but also just from consumer preference um, is here to stay, but brands do have a huge opportunity to go directly to consumers and nurture and nourish that relationship because, you know, today, yesterday, and always a brand is one thing. And I, I've always said this, a brand is promise, right? A brand is a promise that you have with your customers and brand loyalty is something that, you know, companies spend billions of dollars to, uh, to keep. So brands do have a, a great opportunity to make sure that they um, are keeping that promise with their customers and that they have a direct relationship with them. So I do think that you have to do a little bit of both. Um, you know, it was interesting when I was client side for an iBlink um, working in genomics, um, I had launched a consumer genetic testing product and we were beholden to Amazon for sure. I mean, that's where most people were buying things. And this was about three years ago. And I'll never forget it. Amazon um, 
called me up and said, you know, we see how you're selling in our marketplaces. And, you know, we know that you're selling up against the ancestry.coms and the 23s and me's. Um, we've been talking to all of them and here's what we'd like you to do. Pretty much in a nutshell, they said, um, and I'm not quoting them, but fire your, all your agencies, you know, fire half your sales team and let us take control of your product. We're going to set the pricing. We're going to set the distribution and we'll manage all of it for you. And we guarantee a 20% lift in sales in Q4. Hmm. And it blew my mind. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, first of all, it's kind of collusion, I, I think, you know, um, but also that they were able to, you know, command that type of guarantee, you know, that they were able to, to force that. So that for me was the first time where I saw um, you know, the power that these on online retailers, and, and this was, like I said, three, three or four years ago, Amazon has just become leaps and bounds more strong um, since then. I, and is having a lot of issues. I read something last week where they were, you know, muscling into asking for a piece of their, uh, their business, their customer's business, so that they, if they did go public, that they would get a piece of it. So it's interesting um, to see the power that they have. Um, but I do think that a lot of power still lies with the customer, right? With the consumer. Yeah. And that's where, you know, I see a lot of the work that I'm doing now through Communitas, um, my consultancy is really, you know, helping companies with their ESG strategies and what ESG is, if, if um, you're not familiar, because a lot of people are like, oh, I hear it a lot, but what does it mean? Um, it's environmental, social, and governance, ESG. And it's been sort of this like niche little, um, almost like an investment practice around some um, boutique investment firms that were only investing in companies that were, you know, doing good for the environment, doing social justice work. And what I saw a few years ago when I started Communitas was, this is the future. You know, this is, it's not a nice to do anymore. You know, this whole idea of conscious capitalism that John Mackey started with Whole Foods, you know, years ago yeah. um, was really becoming more mainstream and it's where companies need to go. Now, looking back over the past year, I mean, last summer, what we saw the S in ESG became even more prominent, you know, where you had um, even now um, Toyota, I think it was, it said that they're stopping camp uh, campaign, campaign funding for anyone that was involved in the insurrection on January 6th. So you've got these brands and these companies that are sort of balancing this tightrope on, you know, they want to do well by the environment. They want to do well with a lot of the social justice issues that isn't just um, related to racial inequality and income inequality, but also gender inequality and, and wage equity, you know, things that you hear and you keep reading about. Those are not nice to do's anymore. Those are have to do's. Yeah. So when I say that there's a lot of control and opportunity in the customer's hands, the customers have the control and they can say, we're not going to shop here, you know, or right. we're not going to buy that product. If we don't agree yeah. with you. So it's interesting times. No, really interesting. And, you know, you talk about this power shift, you know, when, when Sam Walton in 1962 was opening the first Walmart store and Target and Kmart and everyone was kind of coming along around about the same time, the, the brands had all the power. If a, if, if a brand didn't want to, you know, retailer had to, in some cases, you know, really beg that, that, uh, that brand to sell to them. Uh, and then it shifted over, over time as the retailers, you know, grew and, and scaled, then the retailers had all the power and they were able to beat down the suppliers on, on price and terms and all these things. And then smartphone comes along and, and the consumer gets wicked smart. And, uh, and, and now it's, it's not just about what, what they know, but what, but what they want, what they demand and, and ESG, like what you're talking about. I remember when I was at, at Walmart in, in marketing, you know, Bob Conley used to tell suppliers, he, he didn't like the idea of, you know, if you buy one of our products and we're going to donate a percentage to, um, you know, to, to this cause, he's like, you know, just do the right, if you want to do it, do it because it's the right thing. And, but I don't, I don't know if that, that would be true anymore. I, I think that consumers care or certainly are more aware of what's going on in the world that they live in. Um, and, uh, and are definitely changing their, their, in terms of their expectations and, and demands of the, of the companies they do business with. 
It's changed. You know, speaking of Walmart, I launched a product uh, with Walmart um, called Curvation. I don't know if you were there hmm. then. Um, it was a line of intimate apparel for curvaceous women okay. um, with Queen Latifah was our spokesperson. What year was um, that? Oh my gosh. I was just, so I was engaged. So it was 20, 2002. 2002, okay. 2003. And um, I spent many a time, many meeting down in Bentonville. Now that time, that period of time, the retailer had the power. Mm. Walmart had the power for sure. This product was VF. It was um, um, Vanity Fair Intimates in North Carolina. And yeah, we created this brand exclusively for Walmart and uh, Walmart was calling the shots. And yeah. um, of course that was pre, pre iPhone. It was pre Facebook. Yeah. But it was also pre-social social movements. You know, the fact that yeah. we were creating this line of, of, you know, be proud of your body, be proud of your curves was still very limited to um, the Hispanic and Latino community, which I found, you know, the, the, this, this community of Hispanic women and Latino women were proud of their curves. That's awesome. You know, why can't the Caucasian women be proud of their curves too? It didn't seem, it didn't seem, um, it didn't make sense to me. Now, what do we see? I mean, I just got an Athleta catalog in um, that had a woman who had to weigh 230 pounds on the cover. That's mm -hmm. awesome, you know, that we are celebrating, you know, all sorts of differences. Um, so we, we have come a long way in almost 20 years. You know, it's taken yeah. us a long time. Um, but I do think that we're going to start seeing more and more of that. Um, but interestingly, you know, we are so divided in this country. We are so divided politically that brands, um, you know, are are politically influenced and decided. You know, I read an article recently that I thought was fascinating that if you wear Wrangler, you vote red. If you wear Levi's, you vote blue. Mm. I mean, here's a brand that's like, you know, two brands that are just, you know, completely different demographics. And yeah. it'll be interesting to see, you know, how much more of that and how brands are going to react. Yeah. So the article I wrote back in 2014, it was so simple looking looking back, but it was this idea that beyond Dr. Christensen's view that um, you know it's about product performance and, and utility and the and the role that it plays. My approach was you got to get on the shelf and then you got to stay on the shelf, and and mm -hmm. and so it was it was all about having a product that performs absolutely and needs to kind of you know kind of kind of fit within the category and all these things, and then you as a supplier have to be able to keep your promises and and you know keep your promise with respect to flowing goods and staying in stock. But again, it was a kind of a retail someone who grew up in retailer. It was a perspective. It was on you know uh, formed uh, conclusions that were formed on that basis. But what, are, what other advice would you give to someone today as they're building their go-to-market strategy, whether it's a small brand or a big brand? And I know ESG is going to be a big part of it, but what, what are some of the things that you would recommend that, that as someone's getting ready to launch, that make sure that you've checked these boxes before you've moved ahead? Yeah, it, you know, and like I said, when we first started chatting, um, it's remarkable to me how these things have not changed. You know, that mm. this is what I'm going to tell you right now um, was in the book. And it was in our papers and it still remains true. And um, I remember I wrote a blog post or Jonah and I wrote a blog post for uh, Harvard Business Review's blog. It wasn't in the magazine on, um, it was right after the, I think it was the iPad launched. Is that like 2010? Yeah, because the iPhone launched in two, 2007, which I still think, you know, 2007 as a year that changed everything. Everything. Um, everything. I mean, in addition to the fact that my son Linus was born. We always, I'm like that, we always laugh that Linus was launched that year and so was the iPhone. Um, but also Twitter was launched. And I think that Twitter has a real place in here too that gets lost. I mean, sure, Facebook and um, and a lot of the other platforms, TikTok, as I mentioned earlier now, is what I'm obsessed yeah. with. Um, but I think that uh, Twitter has a real place, a place in there too. Um, 2010 was the launch of the iPad and we wrote a piece on everything that you need to know about new product launch. You can learn from watching Steve jobs and, you know, mm -hmm. God rest his soul. He was still alive then. And he was a maestro at yeah. managing new product launch. And here's what he did. I think we had like 10 things and I could probably remember three or four of them, but one was create anticipation. You know, create anticipation by, you know, really juicing up the influencers, the people that are going to really, uh, you know, and it's so funny, I just worked on a launch last week for one of my clients, um, Mass Luminosity, which is down in Dallas, hmm. um, and Angel Munez, who is the founder of um, 
esports. If you're familiar with esports, oh. um, yeah, okay, good. So uh, he founded esports back in the '90s, and he just launched last week this new video conferencing platform called Beacon. You can check it out, Beacon.com. It's it's really cool because it's based on a lot of the fundamentals of gaming. Um, as far as like pix pixels and color saturation and all that. And it also is encrypted end to end. So you don't have any of the security issues that you um, have with Zoom. So it's so interesting because I probably don't work on as many launches and I just worked on one that happened last week. And the learnings that I had, he's got this group of over a million gamers hmm. that follow his every move in this thing called G Tribe. Now, just like, what Steve Jobs did when he would prepare the market for his launch, he would let those who were obsessed with Apple, you know, get ready, this is coming, here's the date, it's gonna be Tuesday, July 15th, you know, and would create this anticipation. And that is one of the things that Angel did with the Beacon launch. He had these million um, followers on G-Tribe waiting for what this is that he was gonna drop, you know, what is this gonna be? And he had over 100,000 signups in the first hour. So that's, you know, brilliant in creating anticipation uh, among your core audience, right? I think also, you know, if you have a product that isn't an iPhone or a, an iPad, um, and you've got a built in following um, tribe, like Steve Jobs did with Apple, is find who would like it, right? You can do a little bit of brand investigation on, you know, if your product is is going to appeal to people that um, for instance, another product launch that I'm working on right now is um, a company called Cooking Without Borders, and they have a new spice mix that's actually the delivery is pretty cool. Um, and that's something else I want to talk about, too, is, is the product attributes and how important that is. But the delivery is cool in that it's these little packets that are, you know, measured out. It was created by a chef. And one of the things that they have done is really looked specifically for for people that have an interest in Indian cooking because the first spice mix is for pe people from Indian culture. So find people before you launch and then get the, uh, create that anticipation. And uh, Jobs was brilliant in that. You always remember the lines you would see outside of the Apple store, you know, people waiting to get in. I mean, it was just crazy that people couldn't wait to try, try that product. Um, so, one of the, the things that we did look at, I just mentioned product attributes and how important that is. We, um, we, I created something with Carol Cohn actually, that's in my book, but um, I worked with uh, the brilliant Carol Cohn for a number of years before I worked with Joan. And Carol and I created um, the product innovation spectrum and Joan and I adopted it in the book because it really was, and it still does stand, stand the test of time. I usually in my book, I can find out what page it's on because it was always earmarked. But what the product innovation spectrum is, is it has three, three buckets, right? A mm -hmm. product is either revolutionary, it's evolutionary, or it's a line extension. It's going to fall into one of those three things. We tried desperately to figure out a fourth or a fifth and we couldn't. It was either it's revolutionary, evolutionary, or a line extension. You're going to fall into one of those three buckets. And based on where you fall into those buckets, that's what you need to do to build brand voice. And if you are revolutionary and you wouldn't believe how many products think that they're revolutionary and they're really not. But when you are revolutionary to build brand voice, product is king. Like you are like the iPhone. Like it is so revolutionary that it's completely different than anything else that's out there. Just by virtue of that, you're going to get news around it. The Segway was another example of, of something that was revolutionary. The Post-it note we always used to use as an example. You know, something that is the product attributes are so unique. Um, and as you move down that product innovation spectrum, you need to do different things to build, build brand voice. As you're evolutionary, you need to borrow some equity from you know, endorsements from celebrities or sponsorships and partnerships. And then as you evolve further down to line extension, the same, you, know, you need to, to borrow even more equity. So I always found that to be you know, an interesting test to put a product through. You know, where do they fit on that innovation spectrum? Because innovation is going to really drive your, your messaging and your launch strategy. Yeah. I, I was on my computer a second ago look, trying, to, trying to pull up something. And I'm, I'm reading a, a book. To, to say I'm reading it sounds like I'm like 
pushing hard through it. I'm not, I kind of pick it up and put it down, pick it up and put it down. But it's a book called uh, Super Consumer, Simple, Speedy and Sustainable Path to Superior Growth by Eddie Yoon. And it's um, th- th- this, I- this idea, this area of super consumers is, is incredibly fascinating. And it's relevant because it ties back to what you were saying about Steve Jobs. And it's that 10% of a category shopper uh, 10% of a category's shoppers are responsible for 50% plus of a brand's profitability. And mm-hmm. those super consumers are a source of almost every one of the, 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 the most meaningful insights. And I think that's what Apple has done masterfully is they've got these incredibly passionate, obsessive, even irrational mm-hmm. um, super <laughs> yes. consumers that are going to, they're going to spend whatever they have to spend to get their hands on the next product from Apple uh, because they just have to have it. And so this idea that in any category, these super consumers exist if, if, if companies will just spend the time and, and, and energy to find them and then to build a community out, you know, with them. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's incredibly interesting. It is, it is, it is. There are only certain brands. Tesla is another that I'd argue is a brand like Apple. Um, mm. Starbucks is a brand that has, you know, really passionate consumers. Patagonia is another, you know, it's knowing your, um, doing those intercepts and understanding your consumer and why they're passionate about your brand. It's hard, it's hard work because you really yeah. don't have, like you mentioned, um, you know, that, that loyalty. And I remember working with Procter, um, they had what used to be called FMOT. I'm sure with Walmart, you guys probably heard about that a lot. The first moment of truth, FMOT, yeah. which seems so quaint and antiquated now, doesn't it? Like you mm-hmm, would, mm-hmm. that intercepting point that you would have with the consumer at this, at retail, at the store level, at the shelf, like, that's the FMOT. And, you know, then they, then they evolved it into uh, ZMOT or zero moment of truth online because you're, you're Googling. I don't know what they're talking about now, but it's completely different. (laughs) It's gotta be right. right? Um, There's so many upstart brands, you know, when you look at, if you were loyal to new balance or Nike, now there's like a hundred different shoe brands to try, you know, bras. I've never seen so many different brand extensions around bras. So I think that the stalwart brands, you know, those those that um, are tried and true, they've got a really tough job, you know, to keep right. keep their consumers there. There's a there's a Leonardo DiCaprio movie, and I cannot for the life of me think of the title, but it's it's all about planting an idea in someone's head, and I think that probably has become the the, mo- the first moment of truth for us now is the first time that you know that product placement or or uh, you know something kind of put the idea in our head before we even realized that you know what they were what they were doing it takes place and and we don't even realize it's happening anymore it's so true you know and that you just reminded me of another thing that we always used to tell uh, clients and this i think still stands true don't do one thing you know mm. your biggest mistake can be just to put your money only in couponing or only in sampling or only in tiktok or digital ads you have to spread it out and i think in this you know being agile is is nothing new in marketing anymore but it truly you know testing and refining testing and refining because you have to do many different things to figure out what works and then do more of that and do that yeah. really fast right well, I've got one more question and then I want you to spend, uh, or I'll ask you rather to, to spend a couple of minutes kind of talking about what you do and how, how brands can, uh, can, can engage, you know, with, with you. Um, what, what are some of your favorite brands today? Who's, who's doing it right? And maybe it's some of the big brands, maybe it's some of the smaller brands that, that few of us would even be aware of, but um, who, who do you like? Who's, who's launching well? I am continually astounded by the Patagonia brand, you know, Mm. and they've just expanded into food. And Mm. I find that fascinating also, you know, they seem to really understand their customer base. Um, My neighbor actually used to do uh, all the sales for Patagonia on the East Coast, um, you know, visiting all the retailers up and down the East Coast. And I used to say to them all the time, like, dude, how do you guys do this? Where you're actually taking out ads, asking people to sell their old Patagonia jackets on eBay not to buy new ones, but yet you still are busier than you've ever been. Um, And it's such an interesting, um, an interesting thing because yeah, that their, that customer, that brand is just, they get their customer and they know what they want. And it's been interesting to watch them expand into package goods. Um, I've been watching that really closely. So that's, that is a brand that, um, that I think constantly delivers. And that's the barometer that I hold brands to. 
um, delivering, you know, that they deliver, that they know their customer, that they're constantly, um, to use a 90s phrase, I think that a lot of marketers use surprise and delight, you know, surprise mm -hmm. and delight. Well, um, and they, they have been unwaveringly consistent from, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. is, you know, why the work that I do now, I think, you know, I left agency life um, and client side life, you know, very frustrated and dismayed at what I saw as a lack of authenticity or, you know, having come from decades of working on cause related marketing programs, you know, really truly feeling I was putting lipstick on a pig, mm -hmm. you know, that we were saying we were going to do this, but you know, we, we weren't, it was just to drive the stock price up or it was to mask something else. And I think social media and just the transparency that is available now to consumers is, you know, it makes the job much harder to do, you know, to hide something or to try to protect it. But I just think that, you know, with the climate crisis, and that's what it is, a crisis, you know, and looking at uh, what we've just lived through, you know, this past, these past 15 months, and some would even argue four years, Mm -hmm. um, it's things are changing, you know, and there's never been a better time for brands to really, you know, renegotiate their relationship with consumers because it is, um, you know, you'd always hear in um, marketing in B school, you know, there's only certain points in time where you can actually integrate yourself into a, a consumer's life lifestyle because you use the laundry detergent that your mom used, but you know, when she gets married, she's gonna consider a different laundry detergent or when she has a baby, and I use she because that was all that we really looked at, right? The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. 90% hmm. of household purchases were done by mom, but that's changed dramatically right. too. Day doesn't go by, I don't see, I see probably more dads pushing strollers and carrying babies and baby borns than I do and I don't know if that's because of where I live in Boston, but it's definitely a different, a different world. So I think that, you know, brands have an opportunity now to really change, you know, that, that interaction that they have with consumers. So they, they have to do their homework. They have to do their research. And it's not just focus groups, you know, that old fashioned way of just doing, you know, intercepts and sitting in a room um, of, of asking consumers. There's so many great ways to really get behavioral insights and emotion from through technology and asking consumers mm -hmm. about what they think of brands. So there's, there's many, many different ways to do it now. Yeah. Well, in wrapping up, tell us again about the work you're doing today and, and how someone might, uh, might reach out to you if they have an interest in, in learning more about, about that work and, and uh, maybe even partnering with you on some initiatives. Yeah, so Communitas um, started two years ago. We just had our, our second birthday on Independence Day. Ah, congratulations. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, we do three things. We uh, excavate, operationalize, and communicate brand purpose and corporate purpose. Um, a lot of our work is actually with, with companies, with organizations. And through excavation, it's really kind of digging deep into understanding what it is that makes that company or that brand special. You know, your, I think Simon Sinat always calls it, you know, your why, you know, what's your why? It's got to be at that center. And then what's equally as important, you know, once you understand that is how are you operationalizing it? And I was really very purposeful in why operationalizing comes before communicating. Um, I think if I had to pick of the three excavating and operationalizing and communicating, probably communicating is my least favorite part of what we do because we've done it for so long. I've done it for so long. I'm really interested in the operationalizing part of it, you know, and how are you taking that, that brand promise and taking that um, what's unique about your company and what you, pur the purpose you serve and that that's in all of your hiring and firing practices. Right now I'm seeing it's so important to be in all of your supplier relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, a big part of ESG is making sure that you've got, you know, your carbon calculators and your material matriculation. And you know all this from Walmart. I mean, truly mm -hmm. Walmart is one of the leaders in really walking the walk and talking the talk. And I don't think any of us would have thought of that. They've been quietly sticking to their knitting when it comes to, um, just doing really innovative things like the, uh, the app that they launched for employees where they could get their money ahead of time. Um, you know, they could get paid, employees could get paid uh, before their paychecks came, almost extending credit to workers. 
And then really understanding um, what that, what socioeconomic impact that had on their employees. That's the kind of stuff that is like, that's where the rubber hits the road, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm fascinated by companies that are actually operationalizing it because if you operationalize and if you operationalize properly, the communications part is easy. The communications yeah. part is like, it takes care of itself because you're, you're, friends, your family, your customers, they're going to want to talk about it. So yeah. you've got to just be able to, you know, continue that flow and just giving people more of what they want and what they expect from your company or your brand. And they're going to tell everybody. So you've got a built in word of mouth channel. And that's really what communitas um, as a, as a word, as a, as a noun, what can, if you Google it, um, it's an anthropological term um, coined by two anthropologists from the 60s who are now dead and communitas is is a movement um, where people have shared purpose and a shared vision for what success looks like an example of communitas uh, are you know i always say woodstock is an example of communitas you know people or any grateful dead concert you know people yeah. coming together with a shared purpose shared vision shared shared love um, the ice bucket challenge is a great example of communitas. Um, and those are the types of things, I mean, any marketer will tell you how many meetings I've been in where, you know, oh, we need to come up with an ice bucket challenge. You know, you, that's not something that you yeah. can just bottle and create. Right. Yeah. It needs to be authentic. Yeah. It wasn't very long ago that we would, would say things like, well, we'll just let the product and service, you know, speak for itself and, and who, who we are, and what we stand for is less relevant. That's not true anymore. Uh, people want to to know the people and the organizations they're doing business with, and and feel good about doing business with those companies. So uh, I can see where the work that you're doing would be increasingly increasingly valuable. Uh, yeah. Julie Hall, it's been so nice to sit down with you and and spend some time getting to to know you. And and uh, it's it's so interesting. You know, like you said, you wrote the book 11 years ago, but it would it would seem like you never stepped away from. Uh, that aspect of the game for, for even a moment. So I, I appreciate you making time to have this conversation. And um, I look forward to uh, getting to know you and, and your work um, in, the, in, in the days and years to come. Thank you Very so good. much for Thank your time. You. It was great getting to know you. And, and you. Have a great day. Thanks, Matt. You too. Bye-bye. Right. So long. Bye-bye.